I'll tell you, when we finished Gemara Saita, um, the, the Chon Levasimen wrote a number of Sfarim, and one of them was called Koivet Ha'aris, Amasechti Yevamas. Unfortunately, he passed away al Kiddush Hashem in the early 40s when he was in America, and he went back to his yeshiva to join them, and then they were all they all perished in the hands of the Nazis. So he, in, in, in this Sefer, is Amasechti Yevamas, a brilliant Sefer, but in the back of that sefer, there's a collection of letters that he wrote. Fascinating letters. A lot of them in Yiddish and Hebrew, English and Kiddush. And, um, and he, he writes there in the name of someone, I can't remember who. He says, the very last Mishnah of Masech Saita. I was going to say this by the seam and I forgot. The very last Mishnah of Masech Saita foretells the future. And uh, it's quite foreboding. And it tells us, you know, how before Mashiach will come, all the terrible things. And, and the very end of the mission is that the children, the young, will have no respect for the elders. The elders will stand up for the young. All these terrible things. And the last words of the mission is, so we can only rely on Hashem. And that mission actually says it a few times. So he, so it sounds like the way we normally learn it, it's like a solace, that even despite all these terrible things that are going to happen, you know, we can rely on the Eidmishter. He says that that actually is the worst curse of them all. And that's why the Mishnah finishes off with those words. The Ein Lanu Lishayin Ela Alavina Sheva Shemayin. And why is that the worst curse? Because people walk around folding their arms and saying, what can we do? Let the Abraham take care of it. He said, that is the biggest curse. Because really, we should be out there and doing whatever it has to be done to make sure that Yiddish guy just, is flourishes and Yiddish guy is spread and, and everything else. And when we see people doing the wrong thing, we shouldn't be scared to voice our opinion. And as many people try to censor us, we have to still be there standing and, and you know, and telling people the way it is according to Taylor and Halacha. So he says, that's what Misha is saying here. The curse is when people fold around and say, oh, the Abishu will take care of it. Anyway, just... Came back to me this morning, so I thought I'll share it with you. We are up to now, Masech to Gitten, Daf Yud Aleph, Amid Aleph. And um, we are up to here. We had a Machlekes that uh, if you follow Rabbi Loza, that the primary Aiden that uh, activates the get are the Aiden Mesida, the witnesses who, wit uh, who witnessed the, the transference of the get. And we had a discussion what about if the witnesses who signed the get were Goyim? And everyone agrees that it's, it's not valid. But if they the are shameless move hakim, which means it's obvious that they're not uh, Yiddish names. If it's obvious they're not Yiddish names, so what are we worried about? We're worried that if you have goyim signing, and we're worried that if we don't find the aid in Masira and this get is being questioned as to its validity, we're going to rely on the aid in Masira. They're goyim. They're not aid in. They're not break kisses. They're not valid aid in. But if the names are there that are signed, it's obvious to us that these are going to sign. So we really don't have any concern that we're going to rely on these two Adim. Are we going to be Goizer that if we allow Adim in this case, next time, not everybody you know, understands all these little nuances and complexities, they'll think that any Goyim can be Adim because it's the Adim Masira with there. So should we be Goizer or not? We had an argument with Tanakama and Rab Shimon. That was the last thing we learned on Shuas. That is the Gemara Tanya, right in the middle of the page, about 15 lines from the top of the page. And that's good Aleph, Amr Aleph. This is the Gemara for the second day Yom Tov. Tanya, we learned in Abel Aysa. Amr Abel Aysa, Abel Aysa. Abel Aysa, Abel Aysa said, Kach Amr Rav Shimon Lechachamim. This is what Rav Shimon said to the Rachamim. But Tzidon, he said to them in this area and region called Tzidon. And he said to them as follows. Loi Nechleku, that the, there's no argument between Rabbi Akiva and Chachamim. Al kol hashtamos on any contract, ha'oilin be'er koyes shalay v'chadim. If they were brought up in a court, a goyish court, which is what we learned last time that Mishnah says the goyish court, a commercial contract is all right. She'afa pisha chaysmein al v'chadim chayim. Even though goyim signed it, it is all kosher because they're not going to hurt their reputation, and we can trust them if they're a shtar raya. We can trust them. Then we said also, I feel the gite noshim. And the Shikrim, the Shikruri Avodim, we had a discussion in the Gemara um, in yesterday's blot about uh, Shtar Matana, which is not just as ever used as evidence, but it actually activates it. How do we treat that? But we also said that Gitin Noshim and Shikruri Avodim is also good when provided that you have Aida Mesira, 
provided that you have um shameless of Hakim Goyish names, so therefore it's good. You can rely on it. You know when the argument is Bisman an ordinary contract, not a get, because a get makes no difference if it was done in their koyas or behedit, because you have Aidim Masira. So we're relying on the Jewish Aidim who, who saw the transference. And the Aidim are assigned if it's Goyim, it's shameless Mohokim. We know for sure it's Goyim. Nobody's gonna rely on them, so therefore it's not a problem. So it makes no difference if it was if it was written in a court or privately. But when it comes to all other commercial contracts, the argument is in an ordinary, not in a court, but ordinary hedgeitis in a private way. Rabbi Kiva says, kosh, still kosh. Because forget, not only a court, people generally have a, a worried about their integrity, about the, not so much integrity, but about their reputation. And if they're caught out that they're lying, nobody will ever trust them again. So therefore, they're going to be careful to make sure if they're going to sign a document, they're going to make sure that it's authentic or that it actually happened. That's Rabbi Kiva's view. And the Chachamim Paisin, the Chachamim say no, ordinary people that's not done in a proper court of law where they have to follow all the rules, you can't necessarily trust them. Chutz, except the only thing we do trust is Gite Noshim V'Shechruri Avadim, again, because we're relying on the Eide Mesira and not on the Eide Chasima. And we're talking about this name signed therein, or obviously Goyish names. With a normal However, star, though, is there Eide Mesira? Hmm? With a normal star, no, no you don't need Adam Sir at all. A star Raya just has Adam. So that's why his puzzle. So one that's second, why. One second, one second, one second. In a Rabbi Lezer holds that all starters need Adam Sir. Right. He paskin like Rabbi Lezer that you need Adam Sir by Gitin. A big mistake is in paskin whether we paskin Rabbi Lezer regarding all other starters. Do you also need Adam Sir or not? But we learned in the Mishnah yesterday that if you have a document with in, in a Goyesha court, it's believed because like modern Afshayu, the courts are not going to undermine their whole system if they can start producing and fabricating stories. So we can rely on remember again, we spoke about the Sashtar Raya. It's more it's 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 evident, it's a case of probability. If you if you look at it from from the uh, from the lens of probability, then if it was if it was made in a court, we don't think it'd be fabricated. But then the court system will fall apart. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, but Gitin, that's not good enough because Gitin we need. You know, Aiden, which by law are considered Aiden. But again, by Gitin, we rely on the Aiden Masira, not on the Aiden signed in the star. And as long as we're not worried that one day you'll rely on these Aiden, the obvious Goyish names. But they're arguing, Rabbi Kivan the what about an ordinary commercial contract signed by, by witnesses, but not in front of a court? Do we give them the credence that they, you know, that think that they're probably saying the truth or not? Rab Shimon Ben Rab Shimon says one step further. So we said before, Rab Shimon, Rab Shimon says that you can have Adim Goyim signed on the get, provided they're obvious Goyish names. Rab Shimon Gamlil says when, af eluk shading. You know when we we will allow that? When we will allow the get of a woman only? You need two criteria. You need it to be obvious Goyish names, and it should be in the area we have no choice. For whatever reason, the the the, the, the Goyim decree that Jews cannot be witnesses. Is if in a place where they're going to create the Jews cannot be witnesses, and you have a Messiah, that's obvious Goyish names, that's all right. But in the place where Yidin Chasma, where Yidin could sign, even though it's, it's, um, what do you call it? Even though it's Aiden Messiah, and even though you have go, you have obvious Goyish names, you're still worried. Loy, we are still worried because we're going to be Geyser. We're going to be Geyser that if you're going to lie on, the, on, the, on these names, next time will be names that are not so obvious, and you will rely on those. You might, uh, you know, rely on them. Says the Gemara, Malkum She'en, someone asked a question, Malkum She'en Yisrael Goizri, in a place where the Eden, the, um, the Nat Goizri, Shem, Shem, Atu Malkum, Atu, Ligzer, Atu Malkum She'en Yisrael just like you make a Gezerah, where you have obvious names, the Tanakama, for example, said, or you said, that is not good enough because maybe next time you rely, you'll have Goyim signed that are not obviously Goyish names, like a David or a Moses. You know, it could be you could be a Goy, you make his Xeda. So therefore, why don't you make the same Xeda as well? We're gonna allow it in the city where they don't allow Eden to sign. Next time we're gonna use Goyish witnesses in the place where they do allow Eden to sign. Why aren't you guys are there? Now, even though really it's Xeda, it's Xeda to Xeda, because it's really two steps away. So what are you worried about? We, next time we're going to, in a city where Yidin permitted to sign, we'll have Goyim sign. 
but we're going to have Goyim with obvious names. So then you say, oh, but we're worried if we allow Goyim with obvious names, next time we use Goyim without obvious names. That's like two Xeris away. And that is a difficulty. And Tasha sort of sort of tries to a little bit dismiss it. He says that the one who's asking the question thinks that it's all part of one Xera. We don't want people to make mistakes. So it's really not an, a series of Xeras sort of step away from each other, but rather it's all one, all in the same pool. Anyway, people make a mistake names. And that means if we can allow obvious names, it could very well be the next time we'll allow even non-obvious names. But a place that we know you didn't allow to sign, to say we're going we're gonna to be worried next time we're going to allow in a place you didn't do sign, that's too too far of a leap, too great of a leap. Because you always make sense. People are going to look for Yiddish Adim. You can have Edom Adim Masida. Obviously, you're going to have a Yiddish Seifer. You're probably going to look for Yiddish Adim. So just because in that town they use Goyim, they had no choice, you can't automatically assume they're going to use Goyim in a place where you did have a choice. So it's not a concern. He wants to tell the story. He wanted to be Machshe Bechnufi Osa the Amoy. He wanted to be machshe in a place where there's a big gathering of, uh, of Amoyim. No, there weren't really a court case, just there was a lot of people there. So they told him, um, you know, and, and there was, you know, these were these were people, maybe even 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 uh, even maybe Adim, you know, Kosh, uh, probably even Dayanim, Goyish Dayani, but it wasn't done in in the in a courtroom. It was done somewhere outside. So he said to him, Amalei Rafim, our koy is tonight. It's not just the people, it's the setting. If it has the, the, the temple of, of, of a court, then definitely they, they're going to do it correctly. They don't want to hurt their reputation. If it's done outside of the court, then even if it might be, you know, people of uh, supposedly of integrity or judges, you cannot rely on it. Okay. Then you want to continue. Omelette Afram, Saitan, we learned in the Mishnah, Omar, sorry, Rafram said, Arkois Tanam. It says in the Mishnah, Arkois. Omar Abbas is Rabbah. If you have a Persian star written in Persian, you gave it before the two Jewish witnesses, right? So you have Yidin who, who witness it. Nevertheless, only you could only use the star to collect, let's say, debts from unencumbered properties. But if the person unsold the product, I give you a loan. And there's a contract. If you don't, you can't pay me. I have a right to go to any property that you sold post that post that date and collect it from there. The buyer shouldn't have bought it knowing that there's a lien on the property. However, um, in this case over here, because Goyim signed it, and uh, even though Yidin saw a witness at the in Masira, you cannot collect from um, from properties that were unsold. Says so the first we have a problem. Why the contract worth at all? A valid all. The witnesses have no idea what they signed. It's a Persian. So we answer, but the other, they know how to read Persian. So they understood it. Says the Gemara, when we write a contract, we need to make sure that whatever you know ink you use, it's a kind of an ink or parchment that you cannot forge, or you cannot add any lines afterwards, you know, after the witness is signed. The <laughs> lekka. And generally, that the, the, the goyim and the, the contract that they write, they're not so p- p- particular about this. But in Jewish law, we're very particular because now that the Adam signed, you can add and erase, you can erase a line and put another line in. The line said, You owe me, you know, you, I lent you $100, and you might change it, I lend you $500. So, the, and so therefore, any document that can be forged to us is worthless. And so the Gemara Bidat fits you put, you use the gold nuts. Which is the kind of juice that they used to use to make sure that the, it's not you cannot erase. So in our rules, we need sort in We have a rule to make sure that the, that no, there's no cheating going on. You write all the details in the contract and everything else, and the very last line or the last paragraph gives a summary of what the contract is all about. So even if in the in between he tries to sandwich in a few more lines. You'll be caught out by the summary because the summary will say, you know, this is that, you know, Ruben Barrett and everything here is correct that the Ruben owes $100 a shipment, something to that effect. So, but in, in the Goetia courts, in the Goetia documents, they don't have that. Says the Gemara, the No, they follow the Jewish way and they actually uh, had that summary at the very end. No, it's, like, it's just mamish, a proper document. Why can't you collect also from the buyer, the purchaser? They, now that there's a proper document and the two witnesses, each witness saw it, nobody should have bought properties there. They know that it's encumbered. They don't know. You know why? Less like color. Interesting. You have to understand the logic behind it. 
when the witnesses who saw the actual transfer, you know, the loan, are not the ones who go around spreading the story. It's the witnesses who sign the document who tell other people about it. And because the witnesses who sign the document were goyim, therefore they're not going to spread the word in the Jewish community. And the and the purchaser can say, I had no idea, I had no inkling that this person owes debts everywhere. I, I bought the property. I thought it was totally unencumbered. Because the Goyim signed it, not Eden. So for whatever reason, and I don't know the logic, but witnesses sign, they're the ones who spread the word around, but witnesses who witness the actual event don't. I don't know, but that's how it is. Rough from, he's an unusual Amoira. Well, the name? Yeah. We have him a few times with us. Okay. Is, that a pup, is that Pupa's son? No, he's his friend. A Chaber is, is it his son? Because because when you when you um at the end of the end of the sechta when you had run the had run he says we're from, from bar papa, papa yeah oh so there you have it so that's it very good Shkosh. very good that must be it okay says it is ignore um further okay boy you may need a shlokish rabbi yechna and the shlokish asked rabbi yechna a question. What happens? You have witnesses who signed a um, who signed a divorce that was that emanated in Israel. The and the names that were signed there, Goyim use the same name. And the question is, uh, there are about five different ways to learn the Gemara, but we'll learn the simple way. The question is, coming from Israel, do we automatically assume that anybody who signed a get would definitely be a yid? And there's no concern, or do we say because it's a, a name that Goyim uses well that we have to look into it to make sure that wasn't Goyim who signed? So Edim Achasum Nalaget or Edim signed Nalaget with Inet Yisrael, and Veshemayson Kishem Nalagachavim. But the names there were uh, you know names that are shared between Eden and Goyim. And the question is, do we have to be concerned and do we have to make some investigations to see whether Goyim signed or not? Says the Gemara. Um, <clears throat> Omar Lai? Yeah, Omar Lai. So Rabbi Yechon has said to the Shlakish, Lai Bali Adena. We only had one occasion where you had obvious Goyish names. We had two witnesses signed. One was Lucas and one was Luz. And, and they both signed, like Lucas, they both signed and they were obvious Goyish names. The Ikshanum, and we said that was kosher. And why did we say that was kosher? Um, because they were Ada Masira. And these were obvious Goyish names. And because they were obvious Goyish names, there was never going to be a Shaila as to um, whether you're going to rely on, that, on these two witnesses because they're obvious Goyish names. So he says, Vedavke, Lucas, Velus, these are names which are shameless move hawking that are obvious Goyish names. And if no one's relying, Lashkichi, Yisro, the Master Mishmasayu. You didn't never use a name like Lucas or Luz. Avo, Shamosa, Achrina, but other names. The Shrike Yisrael, the Maske Bereshem Esayu, but other names that Yidin might use just like a Goyim, then Loy. Then it's not a good get because you don't know. Maybe it's Yidin or maybe it's Goyim. You don't know who it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe Lucas was supposed to be like Luke and that they know it's one of the apostles. A Jew wouldn't, they wouldn't call him Luke. That's what he's saying. That's why they, uh, that's why Jews don't use it. Yeah, so those two names are obvious Goyish names. If it's a valid so we, get, we, we, use, we use Peter and Paul. Okay, because they were good, they were they were they, they started out good being good Jews. How do we know there were no Adam Masira with diff, with these um oh, there was Adam Masira? There was they were, they were told there were Adam Masira there. The, you know, the, the wife said it was Adam Masira there. And the, but the problem is when we have to ascertain the validity we get, we don't know where the Adam Masira are. We always look at the Adam, like it says the Mishnah. We look at the Adam, either the Adam themselves front up or we bring two other people who recognize the signatures. So if it's obvious Goyish names, then obviously we're never going to rely on them themselves. So it would never be a problem. So it's the get, as it comes to us, nobody questioned the validity of the get. We're right, we said, Kasha, the Yiddish Aid, the Messira, good get. If somebody comes along tomorrow, the husband comes forward tomorrow and said, this is fraudulent, right? Then what are we going to do? We're not going to call in these Aid to ask them what happened because we know they're Goyim. If anything, we'll look for the Adam Masira, otherwise the get is not valid. But till somebody comes and questions the get, the get is valid because they were Yiddish Adam Masira. But if there are names that we cannot tell the Yidin or Goyim, so therefore then we have a problem because maybe it's a 
Goyimusayin, and maybe and we're going to rely on it. So that is a problem. <clears throat> okay, says the Gemara further. <laughs> Isn't that a dangerous precedent? I mean, the lady's going to get the get. She's going to get remarried. And they're going to come along and say, "Hey, this is not a yeah, good get." Yeah, but it's not a valid get. What's the point? What do you mean? How she get married? What She's going to get the get. She's going to get, to get no. the hand. She's going to That's think right. it's valid. And then That's six right. months later, somebody's going to come along and say it's not valid. That's right. There's somebody has to be. You remember we learned already. The coil has to be either two witnesses or the husband. If two witnesses come along, that's a serious matter. If one person comes along and says, oh, I heard the get is above my sister, mm -hmm. obviously we dismiss it out of hand. It's only two witnesses that come and say, that, then that's a problem, or the husband himself. And then we had an argument, the Rishayim, if the husband comes along, do we take it seriously enough that the get is not valid? Or we're just concerned that he's going to cast aspersions on the get, and then this family will become a pariah, even though legally there's, there's no problem, but that's where people, you know, will, you know... Revenge. Stand it. Yeah, the, husband, the husbands will take revenge on the exactly. wife and, and harm the family, even though it's uh, logically we don't believe him, but it doesn't matter, the damage will be done. Um, says the Gemara further, Asa will ask you a question. Yeah, Asa question says, Gitin ha boim ibn Isayyab. If Gitin come from overseas, the Aidim chasumim alayim, if Gitin comes from overseas and their agent signed on it even the names are similar to goyish names shading their kosher why are they kosher if nature use goyish names so that we see clearly from here that we're not worried we're going to assume that even though the name could be a guy, we're not talking about Lucas and Lewis, which is only going to use a Christian or something, but a Goyish name, like Tony or George or whatever it is, that you didn't go by those names like Goyim. And since most you didn't go the name of George, but we're going to assume, that was written, why would you get Goyim? You probably got Eden. So he's asking a question of the Why do you say that in the Israel, if you have names Eden and Goyim, we can, we're going to possibly the get when we see who's all right. It says clearly the reason why. Most Eden who live outside of Yisrael use Goyish names. But in Yisrael, most Eden use Yiddish names. So if we see a name there that is not obvious, uh, you know, it could be Yid, could be a Goy, we don't know. It could very well be a Goyish name. Hi, George. Which is very interesting because you look at... Hang on, hang on. Tom, me... We see in when we see that Tanoyim in the Mishnah, almost all of them have Yiddish names, Russian Kaidish names, almost all of them. And yet in the Amarayim and the Gemara, almost all of them have non-Yiddish names. And you see right here, the Gemara says in Ejisro, they all carried Yiddish names, but in um, in Chutzler, it's most Yidden had Goyish names, which is fascinating. Why? Especially, especially when in Mitzrayim, the whole schus that we left Mitzrayim was Shleshinu Eshmam. We didn't change our names. And what happens all of a sudden here in, you know, Chutzler? Well, it's not all that different today. I know, but I, I, there's a, it, it, interesting, the Israelis, they all, they all carry their, their Hebrew names. Even, yeah. you know, when they, they commit all these crimes and they go to jail, it's still Yossi and uh, Moti and uh, all these nice Yiddish names. There was a family, you remember, there's a rabbi, Shik that used to be yeah. in Melbourne. Yeah. So the family of, of, of Rabbi Sheik, they come from the Maram Sheik. I'm going to tell you this once. The Maram Sheik was a Talmud from the Chassam Seifer. And, you know, the Chassam Seifer had a crusade against the Enlightenment movement, against reform. His Talmudim as well, the Maramash, Maram Sheik. And the reason why he called himself Sheik is because he had a crusade. His crusade was that every year should go by the Jewish name and not call themselves, especially in that part of the world, uh, of Eastern Europe, they used to they used to call themselves by their Goyish names. So um, he made his crusade, and he called himself Shik because Shik is a Russia Tavis Shame Israel Kaidish, and that's why he called his family name Shik. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, but here in, 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 in Sydney there, there was a there was a rabbi Shik. He was in Melbourne. Maybe the same rabbi. He lived in Sydney. Yeah, he yeah he moved. It's, it's a big mishpocha. It's a big family. In, in in Germany, there was a custom for generations that they, at the Bris, they used to give, I forgot the German name for it, they used to give a, give the Yikosh Mabi Yisrael, and they gave a Goetia name. It's called, um, any Yekas here? 
Uh, well, in Hungary, we know they all took names of um, no, but but at, in, kings in, and all that. In, in Germany, I mean, it's written here. I've got the book, Shoshe uh, Menag Ashkenaz. It's written there that they used to, at the Bris, they used to give, this This is the Kari Yishwa B'Yishra, the, the, the Yiddish name, and they would give another name, Fritz or Heinz or something. Um, all the, all the Yekas would know it. Interesting. Okay, let's finish. The Ikidami is another version that Kimas Nita Boy Menei. In fact, Resh Lakish's question was not about Etz Yisrael, but about Chutz Loretz with names that are Shared between Eden and Goim, who posted them as did. Rabbi Yechon just quoted him the Brisa saying that in Chutzlar is because Eden did go with Goyish names. We'll assume that if you made a get and you had Adam Siri Eden, you probably used Eden to sign. I the names sound Goyish, but Eden also had Goyish names. Okay, next Mishnah. Can I just ask? I'm not really. I'm a bit confused. Um, what else is new? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for who was going to be the one who says that. I wasn't expecting it from the Magid Shira. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. The question is if you've got names on the star that are not obviously Goyish names, why is that a problem again? You're talking about now get or a star right? What are we well, talking get, about? Well, get really. Which one? You said star. You mean a get, um, a get? When I said a star, I'm, well, I wasn't actually differentiating, but if you're asking me, I'm going to say get. Okay. Buy a get. If you have Goyish if people, Goyim are not valid witnesses and yes. they have nothing to do with, with Gitten, which is Krisis. So therefore, they cannot sign on a get. So according to Ramey, there's nothing to talk about. The, the get is disqualified. But aren't we saying there's Aide Masira there? So according to Rabbi Lezer, Ramey wouldn't help Aide Masira. According to Rabbi Lezer, who believes, according, well, sorry, take it back. Most opinions according to Ramey wouldn't help. But um, some say Ramey holds, you can use either one. But according to Rabbi Lezer, holds Aide Masira. You don't need witnesses at all. However, once you have witnesses, we have a rule that says Mizuyif Metoichai. We had this Gimel Alf, you remember. No witness at all is perfect going to Rabbi The moment you have witnesses, you got to do it right. You got to do it right. So if you have Goyish witnesses, it's like there are no witnesses, but it's not so simple. Because what happens if somebody comes and questions the validity they get, if you have witnesses signed, what do you do? You just bring in some people. Do you recognize these signatures? And if they say yes, that's it. The get is valid. But if this, if we're relying on the witnesses signed in the get, and they happen to be Goyim, that's no good because the get is not really a kosher get. Uh, I mean, at least we haven't proven that the get is a kosher get, and we're relying on the witnesses going. You can't do that. So you definitely can't do that. However, Rav Shimon said, if, for example, the names are obvious Goyish names, we're not worried that this will ever happen. Because if the question, the get is questioned, we're not going to rely on the witnesses signing the get. We're going to look for the aid of Asira. And, you know, it's a big job to find them, you know, where they you know, get came from another city and, and so on, locate them. But nevertheless, we'll try. So that's the issue here. So he makes a get with obviously Goyish names on it. But only not, obviously goes names, but not much here again with ambiguous names on it. That's right. Then we had a shimming a little one step further, even with obvious goes names, it's only allowed in a city where they do not allow Yidin to sign. But if they allow Yidin to sign, we don't want go you not signed because even then there's a problem, people might make mistakes. I don't want only if you have no brain, if you have no choice. That's what the, 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 how do you know who the is? There's no, there's no document with the names of the Adam is there? No, but you try to find out. You ask the woman if she knows, or the shlich. Remember, we talk about shlich brings the get. There's always a shlich who brings the get, right? We yeah, ask the person who brought the get. Could you say before I nech, before nech, I saw it all happening, right? So the Adam is sitter. If was it? If the shlich brings the get, um, was it? Somebody gave the shlich the get. The shlich saw before I nech, before I nech them, and uh, the Adam Masira down there gave the gave him the get. So therefore, the shliach tells us, yes, there are two Adam Masira here who saw the get being you know, given to me or uh, given to uh, her. Yeah, sorry, I'm glad I'm glad it works. Uh, what I can also understand why are we relying on um, on witnesses? Why can't we just ask the cipher? He's the surely he's the one who knows what it was written for. First of why all, why do we need Adam? Because we had we had a gimon base that if the safer signed to get to, to get apostle mid the rabbanon but the yevet im nisas is kosher because he's only a day echad. If 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 he wants to be the aid, he's only because the the, the husband has to point shluchim. So he makes the safer a shliach to be a safer, and he gets two other aid. A safer, even if the safer, because a safer is sachakal one aid, no more than one aid doesn't help us. It, 
Why do you need any ADM if there's two ADM? Say for, you know, a proper, a say for Stam, somebody who, you know, is oh, like a bit of Yichas, uh, he does the, surely you, have to, you can rely on him. For why why should Abbein who came and told us that he saw Reuben kill Shimon, we will do nothing. And now we do nothing, but should Abbein, according to others, will get Malchus, because of Moiti Shemra. Because the, the Torah gave us a prescription of how it should be done. It has to be done with two ADM, doesn't matter, you know, they're, that they're one eight has more credibility than these two eight of it doesn't matter. These are the rules we have to follow. The guidelines. And if it's a machloka and uh, they're questioning the eight him, why can't they call upon the sofa to... Uh, but he's an eight echad. Eight echad doesn't help us. We need two eight him. And the two eight him are the ones that signed the star. The sofa did not sign the star. He just wrote it. But he, okay. he knew what he was doing there. That's the, maybe, that's the point. but he's not. He's not. Maybe. He's not the eight. He definitely had. We had the Gimel Beis, if you remember, about Soskov here. It says here, Gimel uh, Gitim Sulim, um, and and one of them is that the Sefer himself, or an Eidek, whatever it is, signs him. We have the Ksav. Uh, Where is it? Um, the ain by Ella Eid Echad and the Seifer. And that's possible with the Rabban. Because you have two Eidim here, right? You have the Eid Echad, you have the Seifer. It's possible with Rabban because the husband has to appoint two Shluchim and say, uh, two, he has to appoint the Eid as a Shluchim and he appointed the guy to be merely a Seifer, not to be a uh, an Eid. Okay, let's go back to the Mishnah. Why wouldn't you rely on Eid and Masira if you've got ambiguous signatures there? You, you would, but you have to find them. It's very difficult. But there's no difference between who wrote the, if it's a Goetia signature or if it's a Yiddish signature. What do you I mean, mean? An ambiguous signature. We had in our first mission in the last line, if a, if there's ever a question of the validity of the get, what do you do? It doesn't say go find the Adem city, because that's impossible. They, they live overseas, we live here. How are you going to find them? Adem so we have, we have the star with Adem Sidney, that people who reckon either the courts had you know, start other starters so they can recognize, or the people who might recognize the signatures. Because once it's signed, there are many, many more people. The pool of people that can verify it is far larger, the greater than finding him a sitter. Obviously, if you find him a sitter, great. But either they died, you know, what happened 30 years later? It's, it's been questioned. The Amos are probably dead. And the Amos also are dead, but there are people who recognize their signatures. Or we have other contracts where we can draw, you know, similar and, and compare, see whether it's the same. Or not. Okay, let's continue. Mishnah. Haimir, a man says, and we already had this before. Ten get the leash. A man says, give this get to my wife. The star she is A man says, give this get to my wife. He says, give this star to free my Evet Kanani. And the question is, um, this here, this the question is as follows. We know the concept of shlichus. I can appoint an agent to go ahead and act on my behalf, and shliach shall adam kemoisei. Then we have a concept called schus. Schus is when you're acting in my behalf, I'm unbeknown to me, but it, it benefits me. So the din is that zochin la adam that I can benefit you even though you're not aware of it. Why does schus work? Big machlek is rishayni whether zechiyah mitam shlichus. Is it because because schus is just like a shliach? In other words, we are witnesses. Had you known the beneficiary of this event, would have known that this is out there, you definitely would have appointed him as a shlich. So zuchia mitam shlichus, or as others say, zuchus, like they want to argue now, zuchus is merely a gzeris akasav. This is what the Torah decreed, that you could be zuch on behalf of somebody, and we learned it from different sukkim. So uh, we'll learn condition of as well. So, so zuchia mitam shlichus enough. Then we have a concept, which is what we're going to learn over here, where if you're zuchia for one person, but you're hurting somebody else, how do we view that? And we'll see the example of that in the Gemara here. Do we say it works or not? So in the case over here, we have uh, um, the, the husband or the master sends a, a person, he says, deliver this get to my wife or deliver this get shichur to my evid. And then the husband wants, or the master wants to change their mind. If it's a schus for the woman to be free, the moment you gave it to that person, then zochin la adam shalay befan of yizachin for that person, and that's it. She's already divorced. He can no longer change his mind. But if you if you say that it's actually harmful to her, it's a negative thing, then it's a chayv. Then she is not divorced until she actually receives the get in her hand, 
and therefore you cannot change your, uh, you could change your mind. And the same question is regarding an edit. So the question here is, how do we view, um, how do we, how do we view the, the, the release of an evid, the release of a woman? If a man says, if my computer goes down, my battery is low, give me two seconds, I'll just go on to my phone. Okay. You can change your mind because it's bad for both of them. They'd rather be remain an Evid. She'd rather be married because she'll be provided for and take care of the same thing with the Evid. And the Chacham is saying, You're right. It's a terrible thing. You can change your mind. For an Evid, he'd rather be free. And therefore, um, if you once you gave it to the Shlich, it's too late. You cannot change your mind. Famous question that everybody asks. We have a rule. You cannot have a shliach when it comes to do a sin. And we learned in Git, we'll learn later, that HaMashachar, Abelazah says, HaMashachar Avdoi, if you set free your Eved Kanani, your Oivah and Isra in the Torah, L'Oilam Behem Tavoidu. It says in, 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 in Parashat Bahar that you have a Eved Kanani, L'Oilam Behem Tavoidu, your Oivah and Asay, if you set him free. So it's a shliach Advar Even if it would be a good thing for the Eved to go free, why isn't that a shliach Advar Veda? Now, some say it's only the Rabban, but even so, it's a Shliach Advar Veda. Unless we're learning it here in a case where it's a, some say it's a, you're talking about a case where you need it for a minion or something, so it's a good cause. You're doing it, and then you're allowed to set it free if it's for a good cause. Others say that when is that Veda taking place? When you gave it to the to the Eva to be free. Over here, what you're doing is you gave you gave the get to the shliach to bring it to the evet. So therefore, I didn't do an aveda yet. The aveda didn't happen yet, and and the aveda will only happen when the other gets set free. So, but my act of making him a shliach is not an aveda, and therefore, it's not considered a shliach by aveda. The aveda happens later as a consequence, not the act itself of me giving it over to this shliach. Anyway, says the Gemara, and what's the logic? Says the Mishnah, if you just you can you can um, benefit someone without them being aware. They ain't but you cannot harm them if they are not aware. So therefore, the evidence is bad for them. She, why, now, why is it this? Why is it bad for the evidence to be set to um, to uh, what do you call it? To um, to be set free. I say, why is it uh, good for the Evet to be set free and therefore it's a schus? So they say, um, what's the benefit of being an Evet? He'll be taken care of. The, you know, the master, even while he's taken care of, even while the Evet is an Evet, doesn't have to take care of the Evet. If he doesn't want to feed, provide for the Evet, he doesn't have to. A woman, on the other hand, he can't say to his wife, I'm not going to provide for you anymore. The Torah says, you have to provide for your wife. So therefore, for her, while she's married, she's taken care of. If you divorce her, she's not taken care of. So it's a bad thing. For the Evid, it makes no difference, Evid or not Evid, he doesn't have to take care of him, he doesn't want to. So therefore, it's is definitely it, it, better for him to be set free. Is it, is it, is it the master Chayev to, to... Not at all, as we'll see the Gemara later. For an Evan Kani. That's, that's tomorrow's Gemara, you're going to learn tomorrow. Evan Avery, is it? Or? You're going to learn it all about it tomorrow. You're going to see tomorrow whole argument. If a, if a master has the right to tell the Evid, I don't want to feed you anymore, you, but you still work for me. I, how are you going to live? On your free time, go get some. I thought, I thought he had to treat you better than himself. That's an Evan Avery. Talking about Evan Kanani here. And this, and the uh, and or a master can only tell the evid you work for yourself and you earn yourself. But if you don't earn enough, too bad. I don't have to su supplement it. But uh, your wife, even though a husband can tell a wife, you go work, earn yourself, and earn and keep whatever you have. If she doesn't earn enough, he has to supplement it. Anyway, says your mother. But there is a disadvantage, and that is that the Evid, while he's an Evid, if he collects money, he can buy Truma. Truma is so much cheaper because it's, since the, the, the demand is not strong, it's so much cheaper. But now that he's set free and if he goes to try to earn money, he has to earn a lot more or collect a lot more to be able to live. So therefore, it's bad for him to be set free. Just like a wife, you know, when you divorce her, she no longer eats Truma if she's married to a coin. Um, they said to him, Here is different because he belongs to the master, and now that he doesn't belong to the master, as a consequence, he can no longer eat from him. How exactly is that a response? The fact is, you are harming him. The Gemara will discuss in the next few days. Says the Gemara. Taste already said this is not the same Rav Huna we always have, because that's Rav Huna actually lived in the times of Yehuda, and, um, and, 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 and therefore was, uh, was way older than Rav Yimya. And he wouldn't sit in front of him as a student. It's a different um, Rav Yais, uh, um, Rav Huna. 
the Kamenamnim, and he was dozing off. The Yasir of Hunek Omar, every time they doze off, the Talmudim have a wonderful conversation, and you can always see how the Rebbe listens to every single word. So they're dozing off. It's not like you know when we doze off in the middle of a, of a drush of the rabbi. The Yasiv Rabhuna, Rabhuna sat there, Uka Omar and said, Shmamina, from our mission is clear. With the Rabbanan, from the opinion of the Rabbanan, that they say that you can set the Ebed free, even though you're um, you're hurting the the the, the master, right? Because the master now is losing the Ebed. I tell you, if you go ahead and you grab for a lender, you're okay. in other words, the lender, Reuben is a lender. And Shimon is a borrower. And I'm walking down the street and I see Shimon has a, has a, some property or something else. And I grab it on, a, on behalf of, of the lender. It's a valid grabbing and the lender owns it now. The lender owns it now. Because here you see right now, the master wants to change his mind. And we say, too bad that the shliach already has it. He's acting now on behalf of the Evid. It's too bad the master cannot change his mind. So taif is libal chayv. It's a it's a valid twist, it's a valid grabbing. Says the Gemara, if you're learning from here, then you gotta go one step further. The master wants to change his mind. You're hurting the master, he's losing the habit. So what happens is a lender, sorry, the borrower has five lenders. And one of the lenders, a guy walks down the street and grabs property for one of the lenders. He's doing a wonderful thing for one lender, but he's harming the other four. Does he still have that ability to grab it on behalf of this lender? What happens? Omalay, yeah, in. From our Mishnah, it seems clearly yes, in. Look, he's harming the master, and yet it, the master cannot change his mind. woke up. my kids. ruled You're not kind of. And the logic behind that is that the, the play Yeshua says is because in Bamati, he says, because it's Shlich Varbeira. Because you're hurting other people, it's a Shlich Varbeira. Others explain it's not really a schus. It's not really a schus when you're hurting, hurting other people. When is it a schus? Only when it's a pure schus. It's benefiting everybody. But over here, we have... hello. I think his phone died. He's switching to his phone. Oh, uh, okay. Is everybody else on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're here. All here mate. Phone's working. We're all here. I wonder is if there's any significance to where he got jammed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're not supposed to know this bit or something. But over here, because you are hurting uh, other people, it's not really a schutz. So, there, so now the question is, but how you explain our Mishnah? In our Mishnah, clearly you're harming the master, right? Because um, he now lost an Evan. And the master wants to change his mind, and we're not allowing him. Bim tema mishnah, say no. What about mishnah? So he says, "Kol aima tenu, kaima zechudami." That when he said, when the when the master said to this shliach, "Tenu, I'm giving it to you." It's not the pshat the way you thought. The master said, "Here, take it, deliver it." And then the shliach turned around and thought, "You know what? I'm going to act on behalf of the of the evid, and therefore it's is grabbing it." on behalf of the Ebed, against the wishes of the master. No. When the master says 10, what he really said was, I want you to be Zeicha on behalf of the Ebed. So therefore, the master is in agreement with all this. No, but there's no Chav Lachedim in this case. That's why Teufus here works. I, the master, later changes his mind, he changes his mind. But at the time, he didn't. So therefore, 10 is, when he says, and that's why it's not harming anybody in this case. <clears throat> Says the Gemara, I the Eved didn't know about it. Okay, Zochin la Adam Shalei Befanav. Says the Gemara, Amar Rav Chizda, and we'll learn much more about this whole concept of Metzia. Actually, Dapir Alf as well. So we'll wait till we get there. Amar Rav Chizda said, "Hatayv la Machayim Moshchav la Chayim." This concept of Tayv la Machayim is actually Bonu la Machlekes. It's an argument of Lezer Rabban. What's going on here? It's now we learned. Me Shaliket Esapaya. If somebody, you know, Peya would leave in the corner of the field for the poor people. And what happens if somebody collected payer, a rich man, and he says, I'm doing it on behalf of a poor person. I'm not, not for me, because I'm rich, but I'm collecting it on behalf of this poor person. He can't make it. Here. Rabbi Leza says, yes, why not? And the Chachamim say, no, you cannot be on behalf of the poor man. Give it to the very first poor person that you see. Um, so, the Gemara, so what's going on here? I think that's the Rabbi Chizah. I think that's the Machlekes. Rabbi Leza says 
you, while you're trying to acquire the pay for one poor person, you're actually hurting all the other poor people now who can no longer collect this particular payer. So your toif is lebal chayiv, your zeicha behalf of one, the makam shechav lachedim, when you owe so many others. And Abelaza says, it's valid tfisa. That means he holds it all right. And the Chum says, it's not a valid tfisa. So that is the basis of their argument. Says the Gemara, no, Dilma loyi. I can explain their argument very differently. Nothing to do with typhus of our faith. What's the argument? We have another concept, and that is as follows. Who can collect payer? Only somebody is poor. But every person can make themselves poor in an instant. If you are mafke, if you disown everything that you have, then you're a poor person. The definition of poor is if you own less than $200 cash. The word tzedakah is gematria 199. So we learned from that, that if you own 199 in, in, in cash or less, you're entitled to receive tzedakah, you're an ani. $200, you're not. So if a person, if, you saw, if he wanted to, he could have collected the pay for himself. All he had to do was say, I'm not getting everything I own. So therefore I could have been zeichen. And then the rule is, since I myself could have grabbed it, then I can grab it for somebody else. In other words, what happens if, there, if the borrower has five lenders? And one of the lenders goes ahead and grabs a property, but not for himself. And he could have done it for himself because he's entitled to it, because he, he's owed it. But he grabs it not for himself. He grabs it on behalf of somebody else. So we say, Migoy sins, the Zachil and Nafshi has a right to it from his own, from, from his own uh, perspective. Therefore, Zachil Nam Lechavre, he has the right to transfer. You know, I don't want to give it to somebody else. It's the same with Peya. Rabbi Lezer holds, we're going to say, even though this person currently is rich, but every person is able to become poor and therefore has a schus already, a potential schus in this payer. So, nothing to do with typhus, the makam shechav lachen. I'm not a shlech, he's doing it. He himself is entitled to it, potentially. Says he more. I can You know what Rabbi Lezer says about payer, the migas said, the boy makul chaz he wants. He can be mafkir his entire estate, but have a become poor. The chaz elayin suited it to him personally. Since, since he has a potential to acquire for himself, he has a right to give it over to somebody else. He's not harming anybody because he could have kept it himself. And if he would have kept it himself, you couldn't say a word because he had a right to it. So therefore, giving it to somebody else, you can't argue, oh, he's harming us. But a normal case of if one person grabs it on behalf of one lender, harming all the other lenders, he can't. However, so that explains Rabbi Lezer. How are you going to explain the Chachamim who say that he, can, uh, that he cannot collect for the, the, the next person? He has to give it away to the first, first, uh, first poor person that he comes across. Why not? Why can't he collect? But can, like Amir Abban Hassam, they say, because there's a Pasik where it says, the Pasik clearly says, do not collect for the poor man, leave it for the poor person. So we dashin. What do we mean? You should not be you. If you are an owner, if you are a rich person, you should not be the one collecting to um, on behalf of another poor person. So here we have a pasuk. Even if you want to argue migur zochah nafshe, here the pasuk clearly says that you cannot collect for another poor person. You cannot collect on behalf of a poor person. no. No, but Abba Lezer, hi, what does he do with this possible? He says you could collect on behalf of a poor person because me good is Ochel and Hashem. Me boy, they know what he's for. If you're a poor person, but you happen to own a little plot of land and you also have the mitzvah of payer to give away your quarter to the other poor people.